Our next panel is Do Startups Hold the Spark to Innovation? And I introduce to the stage Frank Meehan and the rest of his panel. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't it good? Yes. <laughs> I, so I, the I don't know, David's a ring in. I don't know where he came from. But <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, hi. Thank you very much for joining, everyone. Um, so, we've got a really. God, I'm going to lie back. <laughs> Uh, we've got a really, uh, really, really cool panel. So thanks very much for everyone for, for turning up. Um, and so we're going to quickly just run down and introduce e e each other. So <laughs> just if we take a sip, Megumi, go for it. Uh, hello, my name is Megumi Ikeda. I work for Hearst Ventures. We are the venture arm of the US media company, Hearst. Uh, we've been venture investing for about 20 years. Series A and later, check size of 2 to 10 million. Uh, across a wide array of things. Of course, we do video and media. We're investors in Roku. We're investors in, uh, we were investors in Pandora. We're investors in BuzzFeed, in marketplaces, uh, live events, sensor technologies, a broad array of things. Um, some healthcare, some FinTech. Um, that's us. I sit in Europe, and then I have colleagues in New York, Beijing, and Tel Aviv. Very good. Magdalena? Yeah, and um, my name is Magdalena. I head up Rise London, uh, which is Barclays Open Innovation Platform, uh, where we look at how do we connect, co create, and uh, help startups scale. Um, we have uh, Rise locations in seven, uh, seven different cities across the, the, the world, and um, we are uh, opening a new site here in London in uh, mid April. So we, I guess, what we're most known for is our Barclays Accelerator program, where we, um, uh, where we have up to date supported over 90, uh, 90 uh, companies, and uh, we are launching our next uh, program, which will start in January. Great, thank you, Galit. Hi, I'm uh, Galit. I come from uh, Startup Nation Central, which is an Israeli nonprofit that aims to promote Israeli innovation. And we do so by doing two main things. Um, the first one is uh, a platform that includes information about all the startups, the investors, and the different hubs and multinationals in Israel, basically an online and free mapping of the Israeli ecosystem. And the second thing we do um, is to bring into Israel delegations of uh, multinationals, governments, investors from all around the world and try to match their technological problems and needs with uh, solutions we can find in Israel. Very good, thank you. David? Hey, uh, the name is David Fogel. I work for Waira, which is Telefonica subsidiary, an accelerator program that invests in early stage startups. We have about 10 different locations in 10 different countries. We invested in about 147 startups in the UK and Ireland alone. Out of uh, them, I think 76 had trials and contracts with Telefonica, or O2 in the UK, and the startup raised about $120 million in the last four and a half years. Short and concise. Yeah, I have a lot sure. more, but Did I, I come on. I, I, was on go I want to do the. Right. Okay, it was very good. But I, I do want to say one thing that's not uh -huh. related to this. This is the first time I'm the only white male and pale out of a panel. Isn't that good? And I really like it. So well done. Yeah, Whoever yeah. organized this panel, well continue. done, Mr. Seal, wherever he is. Um, okay, so firstly, just before we start, I really like to try and gauge who our audience is so we can just actually can tailor them. with maybe some practical advice to you all. So who here is a startup with looking to work with corporates or thinking about corporates? It's quite a few. That's good. Excellent. Okay. And who's from a corporate, um, from a corporate looking to work with startups? Oh, okay. That's actually a good mix. Okay, great. Okay. So what we're going to try and do, we are going to really try and get some practical practical uh, stuff here for you guys. Um, so very first, we're going to start off um, with Megumi. Yes. So um, first question to you is then, so startups are out here. They're thinking about like a, a great investor like Hearst comes and approaches them. And they're like, oh, um, but if, I, if Hearst invests, does that cause problems with other people in the sector? So how do you, how do you get around? How do you talk to them about this problem? I, I, in part, it depends on the sector, but I think the easiest thing to do is reference our former CEO. So it's always a good way to sort of reference any fund is talk to the companies that they've invested previously. Um, look, 
I think every corporate venture fund has their own uh, way of dealing with things. There are some funds that are very much investing as a path to acquisition, and then there are some funds that are very much, you know, we're purely investing. There's some strategic value in sitting on your board, uh, but we are looking for an exit. So one is a question of what are the terms of the deal? Uh, then there's the broader signaling question, which I think you're alluding to. Uh, question. Yeah. It, it depends on the sector, A, and um, the history of that fund. So again, going back to your CEO, you can push back on me or ask me more. Well, what about from media perspective, though? So, you know, do they say, you know, how does that feel? You know, or do I, am I not going to be able to work with News Corp if I work with Hearst? Well, we're an investor in BuzzFeed. NBC has come in. Many other players have come in. We're an investor Perfect. in Vice via A&E, which we own 50% uh, of. So there are s multiple examples in our current existing portfolio that shows that that's not the case. Yeah, exactly. And do you, is that the same thing for you guys from a Telefonica viewpoint? Like, yeah, I think uh, it's very much the same thing. One of the main advantages of being a subsidiary is the fact that I can, my main obligation is to work with the startup since if they give me equity, my number one priority is to help them get customers. So if they want to do something with Telefonica or O2, and for some reason it takes too long, I will phone up my contact in BT or EE and introduce them to the relevant people. Uh, so the, we actually, the main focus, especially at early stage, later stage may be different, but currently in early stage it's, let's prove that this actually can be a good business. And if other telcos will like it, then believe me, Telefonica will come in. <laughs> and how many, how many times have they invested after? So going back to the signaling aspect, categorically, Wira doesn't follow on on investments. We invested globally in the last five years in 700 and 720 startups. There is no way I can sit down or any Wira head of acceleration or whatnot and analyze, do we want to follow on? So categorically, we do not. That being said, there are different vehicles within the Telefonica, um, let's call it the same as Rises for Barclays, we have Open Future. So there are different stages. And we do have Telefonica Ventures that invest in some, but that's usually B rounds and above. So we invested in Box, for example. Uh, and we also have a fund of funds. So we invest in VCs that do A rounds. Those VCs, I think, across the globe, we invested in about six venture capitals, A, a stage, A round stage, and I think they overall invest in about six of the startups. Uh, there's none in the UK, unfortunately. Very good. Okay, cool. Well, so Magdalena, Rise, uh, you know, it, all over the world, right? I mean, how many? Seven locations, right? Seven locations. We're in uh, New York. Well, in, in the UK, we're in London and Manchester. Then we New York, Tel Aviv, Mumbai, uh, Cape Town, and Vilnius. Okay. So and so for a startup, a startup here, what does... Rise offer them, you know? So Rise offers opportunities to, first of all, it's kind of the engagement point with Barclays. So there, there are different ways to, to, that, we, that we work with startups. We don't only look at, so I guess, like I said, the most obvious way is our accelerator program, but we also want to, to broaden that into the, the, the more, um, a bigger open innovation uh, agenda. So we run hackathons. We have, um, um, specifically for, for RISE in London, we run a lot of mentoring sessions, which I also kind of call a matchmaking session. So a lot of, about it is to, to make sure that there's collisions with the bank and people who kind of have the, the focus uh, on specific products and services and the startups that are offering these products and services. So it's all about creating um, a space uh, where startups and the bank can meet. Very good, okay, cool. So Gilly, I'm going up to the question here. Do yeah. startups hold the spark to innovation? So you obviously work heavily with, you know, the hottest startup scene in the world. Um, <laughs> and do you, like, so there's lots of corporates and, and, and companies like Barclays that wander down to Israel and go, oh, we're here. Like, you must work with us. Like, but most Israeli startups aren't interested. So how do you get them to, to get engaged with 
all these corporates that wander down? Um, I think there's uh, actually been a very big shift in the past couple of years. Israelis tended always to look on the, on the US. And nowadays we see a lot of multinationals coming from Asia and from Europe and, trying and, settle and starting to work in Israel. And um, usually the most common way they do so is by one of two ways. Um, one is uh, by opening an R&D center. Mm -hmm. So there are more than 300 R&D centers in Israel of multinationals from all around the world. A lot of them have been uh, opened through an acquisition of a startup. So this is one we way. <laughs> And um, the second way, uh, which is uh, cheaper, let's call it that way, is the opening a program, uh, an accelerator, some kind of uh, program for early stage startups. Um, in Israel, it's common not to take equity in these kind of uh, programs, but uh, you get to work very closely with the startups, and then you get to have a very good uh, due diligence, so to speak. So after a few months working with the startups, they know who they want to continue working with, and the Israelis they run for these programs. So almost any startup uh, in the Israeli ecosystem went through some kind of program. And this is a very good way to get your deal flow. Now, you're a, but you're a not-for-profit, right? So you're yeah. neutral yeah. about all of this, right? Mm -hmm. So if a startup in Israel or a startup <coughs> here says, comes along and asks you, say, who, which program should we work with? How, <coughs> how do you deal with that? <laughs> you're Look, getting you're me. Don't, don't make me fight yeah. with all these nice yeah. people. You know, it's free here, like, you know, um, so. And all very broad. <laughs> yeah. So um, to be honest, we're not, we, we don't tell the startups who to work with. They usually have their target audience to begin with. And we, from uh, getting to know the Israeli startups, we target those clients and try to bring them to Israel. And this is the way we work. Um, nice so <laughs> very, very, yeah, very cool. And um, so, so for startups out here, um, and they're thinking about like working with a corporate, um, and it's a struggle, right? There's so many different areas to work with. One of the problems is the finance and legal side can absolutely bog down any startup, no matter how good the will is inside the corporate. Um, so, Magdalena, how do you guys deal with that? How do you, how do you make that process smooth? Yeah, well, I think there's no easy answer to make it, make it smooth, and each separate uh, example, depending on what you want to do with the startup, if you're going to share data or if you're going to integrate their, their, their technology into our legacy systems. So it all depends on the, kind of the width, like the, the, what we're doing with the companies. But we are very, through our accelerator program, we have learned how to um, onboard and how to work with startups much better than them when we started off. We know that we cannot throw a 400, uh, 400 pages contract to a company who has uh, three founders uh, and no uh, legal uh, support. Um, so we, we are looking at, we're looking at developing specific frameworks within the bank to onboard and work with, um, with smaller companies. So this is um, a kind of open innovation frameworks that will simplify the onboarding process and the, the, the governance uh, point of view. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have we can remove it completely. We will never be able to do that, especially not when we work as we were. We're a financial institution and we work in a heavily regulated environment. Um, but it it means that the people internally will know what to do and kind of understand how to measure the risk in a different way for. A, compared to if we would be working with an IBM or an Oracle, for example. So, yeah, there's, 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 no, there's no quick win solution, but um, I think there are, there, are, there are frameworks that can be put into place uh, specifically for, for certain programs that you run in, within a corporate. And they're, they're key for the success of any kind of uh, open innovation project. Yep. David, same. My turn. So I think, I think it's a bit different because we take equity as Telefonica or as, as Wara and you guys don't, right? Yeah. Tech starts taking that. So Wara itself started because the entire concept of how to interact with innovation wasn't really clear. There was internal innovation when you have a lab and then it's usually 10% better of current products. 
or there was full-blown M&A, which is let's buy a really innovative company and kill the innovation by bringing them in. So we are somewhere in the middle. We're a subsidiary. As that, we signed the contract. So we're 10 people. We have in-house counsel. And within, usually, investment, we cover within less than two months. And 70% of the deals that we do are standard. We have a convertible node because there's a, a threshold when you come in. But 30% are bespoke. Uh, so we had startups coming in with, when we were the first investor coming in with a convertible, startup that raised $3 million, and we still managed to come in direct equity, not a convertible note. So the main aspect from that is if you want to work with us and we want to work with you, we'll find a way to, cl uh, to cut a deal. The other, sp other side, which is not the investment, it's more about how to work and trial with Telefonica or O2. I think, going back to Magdalena's point, uh, the sad, sad uh, answer as a consultant or ex-consultant is it depends. <laughs> and because it depends, what we found works best is we have two, pip, two people out of the 10 only focused on doing business development for the startups within the organization. Mm -hmm. One within O2 in the UK and one within Telefonica globally. Right. So all the thing that these two guys do is basically map the politics, tell you what do you need to prepare, put you in front of the right people. So getting 76 trials within the last four years for the startups, that means people that had two people in, a startup with two people in, trialed with O2. And, uh, the corporates guys usually go, oh my god. Uh, startup is like, of course. I think if we look at our job within the acceleration innovation aspect of it, our main ob objective is to shorten time frames. Usually to work with a corporate, especially one as big as ours, 24 months. Even if you're a big company, NDAs and all that. If I can cut that to 12, I did my job. Mm -hmm. And actually the fastest we ever managed to do that from startup getting in to full-blown deployment across all of the O2 stores in the UK is nine months. And that startup is saving O2 3.5 million pounds to date. GH, yeah. Um, we're seeing in a lot of programs in Israel where um, a multinational comes in and try to work with startups that one of the key elements for it to work is to have uh, a mandatory um, person in the mid-level, high-level uh, executive of the global company that connects with uh, the specific startup that believes in him, that wants to take it forward, and then working with this executive can push the project forward. And in many programs that we see, the more successful ones, the ones that had deployed uh, solutions, this was part of the, um, of, yeah. of the key to success. The evangelist kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> Okay, perfect. All right, so now um, I'm going to turn back to Megumi. So a couple of things. So firstly, uh, you know, next couple of years, what are, the, what are the really exciting sectors for you? What are you going to get really excited about here? And you're going to go, you know, if you're in this sector, please come and talk to me right now. I think mine are not going to be all that different than other people in this space, right? So I don't know about the next five, year, five years from now or else. I, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> um, we, like many, many other people, both VCs and the big corporates, are interested in autonomous vehicles and mobility as a service. We own a lot of automotive databases. We have a lot of automotive uh, customers uh, on our client list. So we are therefore interested in what impacts our customers. We are investors already in FIA, which is an Israeli uh, uh, m mobility play. We are also investors in a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing company in China. So we have two stakes there. There's a lot more happening. This whole sort of level five AV is also happening. How we play versus the, the big incumbents versus the big technology players, that's still something that needs to be worked out. Um, uh, new, new platforms. So Facebook is now the internet. You know, what, what do you do on that platform? Uh, we see what's happening with WeChat in Asia. You know, what will be happening with Facebook Messenger, with WhatsApp, with all the new platforms. You know, there are now being uh, games launched specifically for iMessages, for example. That's a very interesting space as well. Um, 
There's a continued consumerization of the enterprise product that we're seeing as well. In cloud computing, for example, that's also very interesting. Um, and then, of course, as an entertainment company, this is tied to the platform theme, is you know, where are millennials, but really Gen Zs, spending their time in entertainment? So therefore, we are an investor in Drone Racing League. We're looking at all of sort of where, are, where is entertainment time being spent? Those are a few. So that's really interesting, because you know, Hearst Ventures Media, you don't really think that Hearst is going to be that broad, right? So, uh, so how, how does a startup discover that Hearst is that broad? I mean, obviously looking at the portfolio, but, but in your current portfolio, you might not have things that you're thinking about in the future. So how do they know what you're thinking about? Yeah, part of that is my job and my colleague's job, and we don't necessarily, we should be doing more. Hearst is a privately held company. They're not out there sort of speaking about what they own and what their assets are. So part of it is us, we should be more proactive in describing the sort of areas of interest to us. Um, I th the onus lies on me as opposed to the startup um, and me and my colleagues. Um, I think though, if you look at um, why, a, why a startup would do this, I don't know, but if you look at the history of what Hearst has done, it has been a company that's built on sort of new business models continuously. We started in newspapers, then we went to subscriptions and magazines, then we went to television stations, which back then were a very novel thing. Then we took this very, very scary bet and bet, you know, to own 20% of ESPN back when people were terrified and horrified that pay channels might never happen, and that continues to be our best best investment to date. Um, and then we go into business media. So you can see there's a history. And if you look at sort of the M&A work that we've done, coupled with the investment work you've done, you see us jumping into these new reins. So this openness to new business models. But you know, again, I think the onus needs to lie on us in the organization, not necessarily. That's why I asked. They yeah. make it easy for you. Yeah. Yeah, straight out, autonomous vehicles. Um, so Magdalena, so these two have a pretty broad remit now in terms of what they do. Um, what about Barclays and Rise? Are you guys going to be just fintech? Like, how broad is the definition now for what you're going to work with? So we we are we we are very focused on fintech. I think that's where we see that through our accelerator program and through our other initiatives is mostly where we can add value for the companies that we work with. And also because we don't specifically invest, um, directly invest in the companies that we work with. Uh, so we, our accelerator program is run in partnership with Techstars, and Techstars put in an investment. But we, we are in it for the game to get for, for new innovation. And I guess that really answers the questions. Do, do startups hold the spark to innovation? And yes, that's how we, how we see it. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, we we are we are we are looking at how can how can we sorry I I, I, I lost my thread there. <laughs> but well, like so, say for like how broad is the definition for someone to come in and work with you at Rise? Oh yeah, I mean, so how how narrow is the definition of fintech? I mean, it can be pretty broad these days. It can right? be pretty broad, and it, for example, one of our greatest success stories, company cut over, uh, yeah. who's a, uh, mind. yeah, <laughs> who's a, which is a, a, a critical event. It took kind them of two real years, by the way. So this is really interesting. So yeah. how you've got to work hard. So I invested in those guys in 2014, probably. I yeah. Think. It took them two years to get a deal, right? And they worked very, very hard at it. But, you know, it's just a power of not But in those up. two years, they had 14, 15 proof of concepts with yep. the bank. Yeah, um, and they would never have been able to get that without um, being part of being part of Rise uh, and being part of a, a part of our community because we had constantly people. We brought their customers to them. Yep. They p pretty much they were in our space and they came in and and they came into every single meeting. They never said no. They said yes to everything, and they knew that they just had to continue doing that. And they they were successful. Um, so. So in that sense, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to ask you, so you two over there. So one of the issues that I've always had with Silicon Valley, it's getting kind of worse now, is that you know, it's, it's hard to work out in the pitches what 10% is actually true. Like the hype factor is so high now that it's just ridiculous. 
Um, Israel is getting a little bit like that as well. So how do you, um, how do you, David? How do you figure that out? Like when you see, because especially as it gets in deeper tech, right? So you know you've got to try and figure out what's real here and what's what's on the edge of being real. So I think uh, it's a very valid question, but it really depends on the time you spent with the startup. So from our perspective. Um, I'll walk you for uh, example what we've been doing the last four months. In September, we opened a call for application for next year. We spent about six weeks. Uh, we had overall, I think, about 800 startups apply, uh, different verticals from fashion tech to cyber. And uh, what we do every time we see something interesting that has enough traction. So the first thing is why pitching or the ability to pitch yourself is important is because when I look at it, I need to understand why is it relevant. So the more information you add, the better it is. From those, if I see anything that's buzzwords, AI, um, you know, machine learning, deep learning, most people don't even know the difference between machine learning and deep learning, uh, we have a lot of experts, both in Telefonica and as our investor network. So we, uh, a lot of good co-investors uh, uh, followed on, on uh, our startups. So we just send it over and say, is it worth bringing them in? And you'll be surprised how very fast those people are able to uh, analyze Check it. Out. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you talk about last time we, we launched um, a call for startups in fashion tech with ASOS. We have a partnership to co-invest. We do the entire acceleration program. And they work in trial, the same that we do with Telefonica. Uh, they do, do with the startups. We had five startups that got into the finals that we're doing chatbots. Our finals, as after we select them, we put Index, Balderton, Felix Capital, uh, and all the top VCs are in the room. And you come in, you pitch three minutes, and seven minutes Q&A. Out of the five, four were out of the race like that. And the main reason is nobody there actually had a PhD in anything. <laughs> so you can't build actual AI without technical people. What you have is probably rule-based, which is very similar to what Siri did at the beginning, which is, I'm writing you the question I expect in somebody to uh, type. So that's a, a very fast way to, to start scrutinizing. But what happens is all of us are very, very well connected to the ecosystem. Um, just to put you in perspective, there's, I think, fewer professional VCs in the world than professional soccer players. We know each other. I mean, we just talked that I know your partner in, in Israel, uh, and there's a lot of people that within one degree of separation. So if you're saying something, we can fact it very fast. Yeah. The, the same actually goes for Israel. There, there are two things. First of all, these kind of programs like RISE, um, they put in relatively small amounts of money in terms of uh, keeping the program alive, but they're not doing any investment. And in this process where they spend a few months with the startups, they get to know the technology inside and out, especially in a country so tax savvy like Israel. Um, they get to know it very well. They get to test it and then get to decide which are actually the 10% and which are not. And we're seeing that in, the, for, for example, the city accelerator in Israel, um, its graduates has a very high uh, percentage of uh, uh, investments of uh, exits of, uh, of success stories because they really do have uh, the chance to get to know them very well um, and again I agree with uh, with what has been said about degrees of separation Israel uh, being a tiny country everybody can pick up the phone and check within two seconds who are the investors who are the founders where did they study what did they do in the army um, do they have any report tickets? I don't know. So anything you want to know, you can find out. Um, background is very easy to. So McKimmy, what about you? What about what's your process for, for like, especially something like autonomous vehicles, right? So, how are you going to how are you going to determine whether this is like how real this is that's uh, been sitting in front of you? It, it is a sector that interests all of us. I don't think that we have actually done, you know. It's a broader interest, I would say. Um, but I think we all, the, you know, the six degrees of separation is an important thing here, um, always. Um, and then, you know, 
there are people far smarter than I in the Hearst organization uh, that we use. And then there are people, that, of course, within our network that we use to do the, to the debt vetting as well. I mean, on the, that AV example in particular, that, that's a... It's a tough one. Yeah, that's a tough one it's for everyone. One, it's it? like, not it's necessarily something we'll invest in, but there's certainly curiosity. That's right, I'm, I'm thinking about yeah. the whole autonomous vehicle investing thing as well right now. I, yeah. do, I do think, so I think the approach that we're taking to it is, we talked about onboarding, and of course that takes some time, but you can't put, you don't put your eggs in, all, in, in one basket. You should be trying out several different, like similar solutions, but several different companies. Yeah. So it's all about experimenting and learning as fast as you can. Um, when, when, and, and as a corporate, if we can, if we can do these tests and the proof of concepts with them uh, quicker and, and faster, then we can, we can get the learnings that we need to proceed and, and know if we want to invest in that innovation or not. So a tricky, might, may or may not be a tricky question for yeah. you. Do you give preference, does Barclays give preference to people who went through the Barclays Techstars Accelerator? Uh, no. Um, non, no, no, not necessarily. So is it not like, worth going through the accelerator? It is definitely worth going through the accelerator. So the accelerator just gives you really, really, like, first of all, to, to get into the accelerator, we get over 500 applications yeah. for 10 spots. So it's very, very dif difficult to, to, to get in. But the companies that we select for our accelerator program, they have a strategic fit with the organization. So. And, and in the application process, we have senior senior people involved from from day one. So in the application process, you are actually you need to be sponsored by someone within the business to be able to get through. So that means that you have a champion from day one as you're coming in to the accelerator program, someone who wants to get your technology into the bank and to help them uh, help a team to solve a specific problem. So um, if you if you engaging through other of our kind of open inno innovation initiatives, it's not it's not as, as it's not as a straight cut. And I think um, it, it all depends on the kind of resources, on the kind of focus, on the type of product that you have again. Yep. Uh, I want to piggyback on, on that because there is kind of a perception that if you go through RISE or WIRA, you, you have landed. If you came through yeah. and accepted out of 500, you're the 10 or 20 that got selected. The way we put it is very simple. We will work our ass off to yeah. put you in front of the decision makers. But if your product is not good, yeah. at least as good as your competitors, if not better, you will not be chosen because you're part of WIRA. Mm -hmm. That's the best that we can do. I think in terms of what we talked about time frame and everything is our job is to put you in the best position to succeed. Your job is not to fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so true. And I think um, as startups are coming into the, to the program or they, they engage with us, they think that they have the in just by talking to me, for example. I'm only, I'm only the first, first person and, and, and I do my very, very best to connect the startups I speak to into the right people, but Barclays is a, we have 140,000 employees. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's going to take a while to, to identify who is the best person to speak That's to. That's 10,000 more than us. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think just having, just being able to start the conversation as a startup, just being prepared to continue having that conversation over and over and over again. Um, that's how you succeed if you want to get uh -huh. if you if you want to get into to a corporate. So, Megumi, so one of the things about Europe um, is exits, right? So, um, that for me, there's too few exits over 500 mil. Like, it's still there's a lot of backslapping at 200 mil, 300 exits. But you know, hey, cool. So what? So. Um, you know, what do you do? You think that's going to improve? Like, where do you think the the comp Where do you think those exits are going to come from? Skyscanners, you know, China, you know, potentially that's that's maybe the way. But where do you think Europe is going to get bigger 
bigger and more value-added exits for you? I don't have an easy answer to that at all. <laughs> I mean, the fact that the Asians are coming in is fantastic. Um, I know that there are a lot of people that were upset when SoftBank bought um, ARM, but I actually think that's a good thing because SoftBank is acquisitive, whereas the company they bought historically has not been acquisitive. Um, I don't have a very good answer. It continues to be the US tech. So do you, from your perspective, see better ret the returns when you're projecting are going to be good here for, from a venture perspective? Yeah, I think you can still see good returns, but it's one of the reasons why we are valuable, frankly, to the European companies, as we can help them sort of get a soft landing in the US. Yep. And you have to have a US presence if you want sort of a US exit. Now, there are certainly exceptions to the rule, but I, and I haven't done the math, but I would still argue if you are the exact same company in Stockholm and the exact same company in California, your exit's going to be better in California. Yeah. yeah. And so I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. But that's because you can create FOMO in the Valley or in California, which you don't have enough competitors to sell to. So even if you get one uh, acquisition offer in, the, in Europe, um, there's like how many will compete on that? Well, and it, typically the offer is from an American. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I think the, the Europeans are not giving themselves, and especially the UK, enough slack. I mean, Israel was uh, basically startup nation, which became kind of sellout nation because everybody <laughs> sold for 50 to 100 million in the fir in between 2000 and 2010. Right. Yeah. But that's part of an ecosystem development. Yeah. Um, de facto, UK is doing startups, tech startups, for five years. That's it. Israel started in the 90s, the Valley started in the 50s. There are so many people that tried, failed, tried again, failed again, succeeded third time, failed fourth time, and their grandson is now an entrepreneur, that there is a, cu a completely different culture, and you have enough big companies that can start buying an internal. And you see that now in Israel, when is internal m and is done in Israel by a, a now I wouldn't say unicorn, but an Israeli big company buying an Israeli startup. And hopefully, bit by bit, it will start within the next five years in Europe and, and UK. Yeah, and, and we have seen many companies um, that have been acquired for smaller amounts than the equivalent uh, in the Silicon Valley, for example. But in the past couple of years, there are more and more IPOs and more and more companies that are going for the long run. And actually now, Israel has the highest number of startups uh, listed on NASDAQ companies listed on the NASDAQ outside of the US and China. Um, so it's, it's, it's a progress. It's something we've been seeing in the past 10 years. But it's going there. And if this is the way, uh, the, the direction Europe is going to. So I'm, I'm, I invest a lot in Asia. I'm very bullish on Asia. Um, in some ways, I almost say to startups, you know, forget about raising money in Silicon Valley. You might want to go to Asia these yeah. days. Um, instead, um, do you guys? What do you? How do you guys link into Asia, or you know, how are you guys starting to, yeah, deepen relationships there? Because so you've got good U.S. relations. We uh, have been operational in China for, I would say, about 20 years, uh, and we have been investors in China for about a dozen years in venture stage. We are also in many other parts of uh, Asia operationally. Uh, Venture-wise, is just in China. Uh, so we've had uh, investments there for a very, very long time. It's a great ecosystem. It is, I would argue still, although it seems to be changing and I'm by far not an expert in this, very much a closed ecosystem right now. That's starting to change as you see Alibaba, uh, Tencent, Ctrip, all these guys starting to sort of look at doing investments and M&A outside of Asia. Yep. Uh, but it is a, a vast resource in terms of investments and M&A. Okay. How about you, Magdalena? So, like, you know, how do you start to get your guys connected into what's happening in Asia? Um, we don't actually. So we 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 haven't. We don't have any focus towards that part of the world at the moment. So that's my, my short, simple That's answer. extremely yeah. simple. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's it. Nice. You kind of have to talk more about that. Yeah. What about from Israel's perspective? I mean, um, so we've been trying, as an organization, we've been trying to work with uh, companies or um, countries that has less presence in Israel at this point. 
And so we'll, we've been working in the past two years with many Japanese and Chinese uh, corporates or investors that are coming to, um, to do something in the, in the startup ecosystem. And we've been seeing more and more um, outcomes coming out of it. So there are quite a few uh, R&D centers that has been opened because of that. Um, and quite a few investment that had been, been done in, because of that. And it's still a challenge because uh, the Israeli entrepreneurs don't really know how to, uh, to talk <laughs> to these kind of investors and yeah. clients. But uh, there are more and more companies in between that are doing the connections, like doing the translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a tool that's helped a lot of companies, a lot of uh, startups. Well, there's a lot of Chinese investment yeah. going into Israel mm -hmm. right now, particularly from an M&A perspective yeah. as well. So definitely. do you think that's going to cause competition for everyone else who's trying to invest and play in, in Israel? Absolutely, absolutely. It's We've been seeing the, the numbers going up and up in terms of investment. Um, uh, the price is getting higher, yeah. and definitely it's, it's, it's causing a huge um, competition. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the price is going up, definitely. And, and what about you, David? Like so I think it's really complicated because Asia is not one country. Asia, if you have to split it, uh, it's Japan, China, India, and the rest. <laughs> um, it's mainly cultural, but also geographical. So expanding into India, it's basically 50 different states with uh, some of them speaking completely different languages, not just uh, English, uh, and some even don't speak English. Uh, the infrastructure is completely different. Expanding into China, basically, it has to be a JV with the government, one way or another. Um, uh, Japan, if you're in China, that's a very big question if you should be or could be in Japan. But there's a lot of cultural aspects there. Um, I think from our perspective, Telefonica has uh, partnered so first of all, we are a sh shareholder in China Unicom, but we're also partners. So we have hubs in Singapore and in uh, Shanghai, and we have different partnerships across different regions within Asia. Uh, by the way, Philippines, I don't know if you're thinking about it, but you should. Just let's leave it at that. Um, and the main aspect that we try to provide is access to resources on the ground and people that will work with you on the culture. If you try to expand into China and you don't get it, you will die. And it doesn't have to be a startup. ASOS just closed this year their operation in China. Um, and it's not because they weren't successful, because they weren't actually expecting the level of demand. So they sold too much in China. So that, that's a great problem to have. Uh, but we have Chinese investors in some of our cap table in the portfolio and some of our startups. And it's always a different structure uh, deal. Uh, but I think, and I completely agree, that Asia is the next uh, route from Europe. I think just in terms of numbers, to move to the US, it's a language barrier. But even then, most startups that succeed in the US have to expand globally. If you succeed in China, Alibaba. <laughs> basically. Free trade. Uh, you don't have, there's one, basically one point two billion people there. If it's the right move for your business, if it makes sense, do you have enough capital and cultural awareness to actually succeed? That's a different question. But I think, you know, if I can map the path is take an Israeli technology, put it in London to commercialize it, and fly to China to expand like crazy. I've got two of those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, guys, so we've got a couple of minutes just left to um, have, a, have a last thought about a couple of things. So uh, I, I've just, uh, the, the main question is just going to be, the last one quickly down the panel, um, is talent. So, you know, for corporates, um, you know, well, everything starts in talent, right? So innovation starts on talent. Um, you've got some very talented people here in, in the corporate sector. Um, but how do you attract the young grads into corporate life these days. I mean, you know, if I'm a hot grab, probably you want to go to a startup, right? So how do corporates stay innovative? I mean, do they buy in startups or? I, I can speak to one example. It's purely anecdotal. I was speaking to someone in New York who said that some of her engineers had 
two of our engineers had just gotten uh, offers from Apple and they were trying to make the decision. And they ultimately stayed at Hearst. And my understanding is one of the reasons behind that was um, at Apple they would be sitting in a room full of engineers and their, their culture would be an engineering one, which is great, right? Maybe that's what they wanted, but what, what, what Hearst, at least to those two, two individuals, offered was the ability to take on several different types of responsibilities, mix with many different types of people, and have many different business problems throughout the day. So it was a much more uh, varied, uh, you know, nine to five, nine to eight, nine to seven job. And that's ultimately yeah, what so you're not actually, you know, very, very pigeonholed. Yeah. It's much more varied and much more, yeah, it's very it, interesting. It's an anecdotal story. It's a great, yeah, it's a great way of looking at it. Um, I think it's a great question, actually, because a lot of what we do with, with innovation is to attract and look at new talent. Because if you think about the traditional banker, they're not really the, they, they don't, you don't think about someone, a, a, a traditional banker would, wouldn't go and work for Google, for example, because they don't have the same personality traits. But so we really need to look at talent in a new way as a, as a financial institution. And um, um, one way that we do that is through offering and showing that we start thinking about our business in a different way, um, being more open to collaboration, uh, also accepting that maybe we want we, we will utilize our talent in a different way in the future as well. And that's Same especially way. what RISE is kind of helping Barclays to understand as well. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not, I can't represent the multinationals, but I can say that we know that in Israel, for example, there's a big uh, gap between the amount of people you need uh, in the sector and the amount of people that are actually um, in the ecosystem. So there's a big problem with that. Um, putting aside salaries, which uh, is obviously something uh, a lot of multinationals are doing, um, they tend to brand it as a jumping board towards you owning your own business. So in Israel, it's very common for somebody to have a corporate job, uh, getting to know the world, different sectors and different uh, big contracts and stuff like that, and then moving on to uh, starting their own thing. So it's an experience thing. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's cool, yeah. Actually, it's not just in Israel. The average entrepreneur is 35. It's not Mark Zuckerberg. It's people that spend 10, 15 years in an industry, understand the problems, and come out and try to solve it. Uh, but in terms of HR policies for big telcos, this is my first ever corporate job. So I'm not sure how much I can attest to that. That being said, 15% um, of the workforce of O2 in the UK has interacted with Waira, either mentored the startup, worked with the project, implemented it, or just was part of the community. And that's a mind shift. The fact that these people today, if you walk into a store, can tell you mostly, most probably, that they have Waira as an accelerator, it's a mind shift that the telco is going through. I think the best thing is that most people are not cut out to be entrepreneurs. They can be amazing engineers, they can be amazing salespeople, but being a proper entrepreneur is a risk appetite that you will basically, after 25, the moment 30, there will always be a need in corporate. It's just a matter of balancing the right things. Very good. Well, thank you very much, guys. So, big hand for our... Thank you. Thank you again for being here and attending. Thanks again.